Chapter 1 One Mile Outside Baker City, Oregon Mid-March, 1881 Leah Carlson kicked a wicker chair out of her way and stormed off the porch, angrier than she'd been in years. Well, years might be a stretch, but at least weeks, or perhaps several days. Maybe riding to town and finding Pa would be a good idea. She glared at the ground, her mood not improved by the thick mud clinging to the bottom of her boots, and scraped it off on a horseshoe nailed to the bottom step. March, her least favorite month, always felt somewhere between winter and spring, with none of the benefits of either. She trooped up the steps and righted the chair. Not the chair's fault Pa had gotten drunk again and stayed all night in town. Buddy, their aging ranch hand, had seen Pa go into the saloon when Buddy had headed home from the mercantile last night. At first, he hadn't told her, in hopes that his boss would return at a decent hour. But that hadn't happened. Leah wrapped her coat closer around her shoulders. Now, most of the chores would fall on her, Buddy, and Buddy's wife, Millie. With Buddy's back giving him fits, she couldn't ask him to do the heavy work, although his pride would force him to try. Why did Pa keep falling off the wagon whenever hope set in that he'd finally beat that horrible habit? Empty promises. That's all she'd ever gotten. Promises he'd change. Promises he'd do better. Promises he'd broken ever since Ma died nine years ago. And lately, it had only gotten worse. Leah had gone from a child at the tender age of 14 to a caretaker and ranch foreman almost overnight. And to this day, she still felt robbed. At least the ranch was safe as long as she worked hard to pay the bills, as long as Pa didn't try to use it as collateral for his drinking debts. But something needed to change. Maintaining this place was too much for her and Buddy alone. Pa had to stop drinking. Of course, he appeared to think everything was fine, and even bragged in town about his successful cattle and horse business. She plopped down into the righted chair. Over the years, she had done her best to cover for him, but he had had enough episodes lately that she knew people were talking. All she could do was keep up appearances and find at least one more hired hand. The sooner, the better. Digging up some extra cash and increasing her herd of horses by a couple dozen wouldn't hurt either. Dragging Pa home and shaking some sense into his noggin sounded very tantalizing. But knowing her father, he would ignore her efforts or embarrass her in public. No, accosting Pa in town wouldn't work. Somehow she had to beat him at his own game and bring him to his senses. She had no idea how, but she'd find a way if it was the last thing she did. The front door creaked on rusty hinges and Millie poked her head outside. Girl, you going to sit there all day staring at nothing? Or come in and get ready for that wedding you've talked about for the past two months? Leah bolted upright and jumped to her feet. Oh my goodness! I can't believe I forgot Beth's wedding. She brushed a strand of hair out of her eyes. How much time do I have to get decent? Millie gestured at her mud-caked boots and stained trousers. Not near enough from what I can see. Guess you could stay at home. It's not like you're close friends with either the bride or the groom. Leah shook her head. I promised Catherine Jacobs I'd help with the refreshments since they're entertaining a few close friends at the boarding house after the ceremony. Besides, Beth has attended our quilting group occasionally since Christmas, and we've become friends. She stepped past Millie and headed for the stairs leading to her room. If Paul comes home while I'm gone, see if you can make him stick around, will you, please? Millie grunted. Can't nobody make that man do nothing he don't want to, girl. You should know that by now, especially if he's been drinking. But I'll try. She waved her hands when Leah paused. Get on with you. Nothing you can do here anyhow. It's about time you had some fun before you're old and gray like me. Who knows? Maybe some good luck will rub off the bride and land on you. She wrinkled her nose. There's got to be at least one man in this world who's marriage material that don't irritate you. Leah grinned. Of course there is, but you snatched him up years ago. I'm destined to be an old maid the rest of my life and live here with you and Buddy, 
so quit trying to fix me up. I'm perfectly happy the way things are. Hmm, likely story. Millie crossed her arms and scowled, the creases beside her mouth deepening. We're not going to be around forever, you know. You are too. Neither of you have permission to leave me alone. Leah choked on the last word and fled to her room. Millie had been the closest thing to a mother she'd had for more years than she cared to remember. Stephen Harding hauled on his horse's reins, his heart galloping so fast he thought it would burst from his chest. Had his horse trampled that man lying in the road? He set the brake and wound the reins around the handle, then leaped from his buggy and ran forward. The man seemed almost burrowed into the mud, his shoulder muscles twitching and right leg jerking. He lay flat on his back, eyes closed, with one arm flung over his forehead. A guttural groan broke from his parted lips. Relief swept over Stephen. At least the man wasn't dead. But where had he come from? The busy streets of Baker City were behind Stephen, and the boarding house where his sister and mother lived was only a few blocks away on the outskirts of town. Had he been daydreaming and not noticed the man crossing the road? He leaned over and touched the man's arm. Are you all right, sir? The fallen man mumbled before rolling to his side and pushing to a sitting position. He swiped a filthy hand across his cheek, flicking away a glob of mud and blinking his eyes. What happened? Stephen recoiled as the stench of alcohol hit him. It was only mid-morning. Surely no one started their day drinking enough to be intoxicated at this hour. He pulled his thoughts back where they belonged. It wasn't his place to judge, especially after he almost ran over the fellow. I'm not certain. I didn't see you crossing the road in time to stop. Can you get up? Nothing's broken, I hope. The man groped for his hat, resting on a flat rock a short distance away. He clutched it in his hand, then jammed it onto his head, covering the ring of gray hair. Don't think anything's broken. I don't remember what happened. I need to get home and do my chores. Stephen gripped his arm and hoisted him to his feet. Let me give you a ride, unless you have a wagon or horse nearby. Don't rightly remember if I do. He gazed around with a bewildered stare and took an unsteady step. Reckon I can walk. Taking another stride, he staggered, his boot plopping into another section of mud, sending a spray of dirty water only inches from Stephen's clean trouser leg. Stephen sprang forward and caught the man with one hand before he pitched onto his face. With his other hand, Stephen took out his pocket watch and gave it a hurried glance. Two hours before he had to pick up his sister Beth and his mother for the ceremony. Do you live far? The man shook off his grip. About a mile or less. My ranch is the closest one to town. Don't need no charity from strangers, though. I'm headed that direction, so it's not charity. Please, it's the least I can do. Bloodshot eyes met his. Guess it won't hurt nothing if you're headed that way. Stephen stayed close as the older man lumbered into the passenger side of the buggy. He had have to scrub out the mud before taking the womenfolk to the church, but it couldn't be helped. It was possible this individual was already lying in the mud when he came along. That would account for Stephen not seeing him until he was almost on top of him, but it didn't matter. He wouldn't drive off and leave anyone needing help, whether his fault or not. The ride to the ranch was silent and Stephen kept his gelding at a hard trot, intent on making the best time possible. He drew to a stop in front of a two-story white house, sadly wanting paint and repair. After setting the brake, he leaped from the buggy and hurried to the other side, determined to keep the man from falling as he disembarked. His gelding dropped his head and nibbled at a clump of soggy grass near the base of the hitching post. Stephen halted on the passenger side, and lifted his hand to the man still sitting inside. The front door of the house slammed nearby, but Stephen kept his attention on the fellow climbing unsteadily to the ground. The older man ignored Stephen's extended hand. Don't need no help, mister. I'm right as rain. He grasped the handrail next to the seat and swung his legs over. Planting his boot on the step, he edged down, 
but as soon as his feet hit the ground, he lurched forward, almost into Stephen's arms. Stephen grabbed the man's arm and held him upright. Pa, what in the world? The feminine voice was accompanied by a light patter of steps on the porch. I see you finally decided to come home and got another one of your cohorts to bring you. Stephen loosened his hold on the man's arm and pivoted, arrested by the undercurrent of anger tinging the words. He turned slowly, and his heart jumped. A young woman who looked just a bit younger than him stared at the man she'd called Pa. Her emerald green gown matched her bewitching eyes, but the glow emanating from them certainly wasn't warm or friendly. I beg your pardon, miss, but I think you've misunderstood. The fiery redhead stood with her hands planted on trim hips, her green eyes shooting sparks. I doubt it. You aren't the first man to bring my father home in this... She shot an irritated look at her parent. Condition. She nearly spat the last word. I appreciate the ride, but I'll thank you next time not to buy him any more drinks when he's had more than enough. Stephen's heart sank, and he took a step back. The last thing he wanted was to add more sorrow to this woman's life, but he hated that she thought him responsible. But did it really matter? He wasn't likely to see her again. He tipped his head. Sorry for the trouble, ma'am. Now that he's home and safe, I'll be on my way. Leah gritted her teeth to keep back the words threatening to spew out as the handsome, dark-haired driver picked up the reins and clucked to his horse. This one was certainly younger and better mannered than her father's other cronies who had delivered her inebriated parent to their door in the past. Anxiety struck her as she remembered the crisp white shirt beneath the suit jacket and the stiffly starched collar. What were the chances he'd come from a saloon dressed like that? She'd probably stuck her foot in her mouth again with her impetuous accusation. Some day she must learn to think before she allowed words to blurt out. She swiveled and glared at her father, who was tottering up the path toward the porch. What do you have to say for yourself, Pa? I've been worried sick, not to mention having to do most of the chores myself. Was that man who brought you home drinking with you at the saloon? Who I drink with is my own business, not yours, he tossed back. I told that fella I didn't need his help, and I'm telling you too. If you already did the chores, I'm getting a short nap. Pa, we need to talk. He squinted red-rimmed eyes at her. Done talking. I'm hungry and I'm tired. Millie can fix me a sandwich. Then I'm going to bed for an hour or two. Nothing to talk about anyhow. He waved a dismissive hand. Go on with you and leave me alone. Leah moved closer, barely containing her frustration. There is a lot to discuss, Pa, starting with your drinking. It's getting out of hand, and it needs to stop or you'll put this ranch and everything we worked for in danger. Pa reached for the newel post at the bottom of the short flight of steps leading to the porch, clamped his hand on top, then maneuvered himself onto the first step. I won't tolerate no daughter of mine preaching at me about my responsibility or my sins. It's my ranch, so I'll do what I see fit with it. I've worked hard making it what it is all these years. You got no call to tell me what to do. He headed for the door. Now leave me be whilst I get something to eat. My head hurts, and I don't want to hear any more. Leah looked at the chair propped against the wall wishing she could kick it again and allow some of her irritation to escape, better than allowing the tears building behind her eyes to spill over. Charlie Pape plunked into a kitchen chair and slid the plate holding his sandwich closer. Happy Millie had fixed it and left. The last thing he needed was another well-meaning female trying to tell him what to do, or insisting he change. He picked up the sandwich and took a bite working hard to hold on to his annoyance toward his daughter. The girl had no right to tell him what to do or how to live his life. It was his business if he drank, and nobody else's. And she was dead wrong thinking she knew better than him how to run this ranch. It had been his for years. A thought pricked at his conscience, but he pushed it away. 
it was his ranch, and he intended to make sure it stayed that way. Leah was a good girl and meant well. He couldn't fault her there, but she was too much like her mother, always trying to fix things to swing her own way and not taking into account what he might want. Of course, Leah wasn't his child by birth, but he'd taught her all he knew and was plum tickled that she seemed to love the ranch as much as her old pa. The girl had been raised here since Charlie married Leah's mom when Leah was only a baby. He had always figured he and Mary would live their sunset days here, and then Leah and whatever man she married would take over for him. Not once had he considered that the unthinkable might happen, leaving him alone with only his misery to keep him company. Stephen Harding paced the parlor at the Jacobs' boarding house and took out his pocket watch for at least the tenth time since returning from dropping the stranger at his ranch. Ten minutes after two o'clock, only a minute since he'd last checked, he would have wagered a guess that much more time had passed. Did his sister want to be late to her own wedding? Women's voices mingled not far down the hall. Moments later, Beth's adopted aunt, Mrs. Wilma Roberts, or rather Marshall, since she'd recently married, and her friend Mrs. Cooper swept into the room, arms entwined and faces aglow. They came to an abrupt stop and stared, then both erupted in snorts of laughter. He tugged at his tight collar. What seems to be the problem, ladies? I can't imagine what could be so amusing. Mrs. Cooper's grin broadened. She shook her head and a gray curl slipped loose from under the brim of her dark blue hat. A stranger might assume you are the groom, if your distraught appearance is any indication. Are you terribly nervous about accompanying your sister down the aisle this afternoon? Mrs. Marshall patted his shoulder. Why don't you sit down, Stephen? It won't do any good wearing a path in the carpet. Beth will be down soon, and my Caleb will be back to pick up Francis and me. I'm not nervous at all. I simply don't understand what's taking so long. We still have to drive to the church. Mr. and Mrs. Jacobs and their children left long ago, and I'm sure Jeffrey has been there for hours. Caleb drove my daughter and her family over early to ready the sanctuary for the wedding, and your mother is putting the finishing touches on Beth's hair. Your sister is going to make a beautiful bride, and Jeffrey is blessed to get her. I am quite certain she will be worth whatever amount of time he must wait. Mrs. Cooper pointed at a chair. Sit. You are making me nervous, pacing like some caged animal. That's exactly how I feel. He plopped into the seat indicated and ran his fingers over his closely cropped hair. He glanced at Beth's adopted aunt, a woman he'd only known for a few months but had come to respect. How can you be so calm? You weren't even anxious when you and Caleb married at Christmas. And why aren't you upstairs helping? I'm sure Beth wants you there. Mrs. Marshall frowned. I don't know what you have to be fretful over. Her face softened. Beth asked me to stay, but she should have this time with her mother. Isabel has missed so much of Beth's life these past years, which I was privileged to enjoy while raising her. I won't rob your mother of an instant alone with her daughter on this special day. Besides, the ceremony doesn't start for almost an hour, and the buggy will get us to the church in plenty of time. Stephen nodded, but didn't reply. He was happy for his mother and sister, but longed for this day to hurry to a close. Maybe once Beth was married to Jeffrey Tucker, life would return to normal. Finding Beth again after an 18-year absence had been exhilarating, but He'd struggled to find his place in the family with the ensuing changes. He'd been the only child after Beth disappeared when he was eight years old, and while he rejoiced at their recent reunion, part of him longed for the time when Ma leaned solely on him for advice and support. Then, suddenly, he was ashamed at the direction his thoughts had taken. More than anything, he was lonely. Stephen had thought his sister's return would unite their family. It hadn't happened that way. 
with Ma living at the boarding house to be near Beth, and him living in a mining shanty on the outskirts of town to be close to work, he didn't have much time with either of them. But Ma was happier than he'd ever seen her, and he couldn't begrudge her that. It was high time he moved on with his life. He'd better get used to being alone.